Welcome to the GCN Tech Clinic, where we aim to answer your tech-related questions and any problems that you might have to do with your bike. And you can submit your questions using the comment section down below or using the hashtag AskGCNTech. And yeah, we're still in quarantine. It's quite a bit of, you know, hair issues going on. I have got an emergency beanie if required. Hopefully it won't come to that. Anyway, this week's first question comes from Ollie Smith, who says, good name, by the way, fairly new to road cycling and I need to replace the tires that came on my bike. What should I go for? The bike came with 25 millimeters and a few people have said I should get 23, which are apparently faster. But I see a lot of talk online about 28 millimeters and above, which size is best? Great question, man. Um, first up, like with many things in life, there is no one size fits all. But multiple studies have consistently shown that wider tires have lower rolling resistance on the majority of surfaces. So, you know, the majority of tarmac and asphalt, if you're in North America. Um, in addition to this, wider tires have greater volume, which means that you can get greater comfort because you've got more air cushion underneath you. It's as simple as that. And you can further boost the comfort by having the option to run wider tires at lower pressures. Um, if you do this with narrower tires, you have a greater risk of getting a pinch puncture. Uh, this is less of an issue with a wider tire. But there are other things to consider. Uh, so the difference in rolling resistance between say a 25, a 28 and a 23 isn't actually that big. You know, you're only talking a couple of watts here and there. And the comfort gains may offset that for you. But the faster you go, the more aerodynamically significant the width of the tire becomes. So if you're concerned with performance, you may want to consider using a narrower tire as it may be faster for what you're trying to do. So next question comes in from Matthew Tan, who says, Ollie, I have a question about my bike's group set. Uh, currently my bike has a Tiagra crank set and Tiagra front derailleur. However, my rear derailleur is 105. Can I just change my crank set to 105? Do I need to change the bottom bracket as well? Or do I have to change the whole group set? No, the crank sets on Shimano in that particular, I mean, it should be fine. It should, that should be okay. You can usually do that. You could run a Jura Ace crank set on a, Ultegra or 105 group set if, if you wanted. Um, I can't say that with 100% certainty without knowing the exact uh, generation of the components you're using, which you've not put in your question, unfortunately. But generally speaking, Shimano uh, Holotech crank sets, like this is one here, they have a 24 millimeter spindle, which is interchangeable between, um, like all the bottom brackets are 24 millimeter spindles for Shimano, so it should be all right. And Shimano crank sets are really easy to swap over. You, you don't really need any specialist tools to do it, apart from the little plastic cap tool remover to get this off. And then you want a Torx key as well, a torque wrench, so you can torque it correctly when you put it back on, but it's just two Allen bolts. So they're dead easy. I mean, this is a Jura Ace crank, but I could put a 105 one on here. It would fit on, no problem. The only thing to make sure you get the same is the crank length, which is written here. Uh, you don't want mismatched crank lengths on either side of your, of your bike. <laughs> That's not good. But you know, to, to answer the question to a wider audience, if you were running, say, a SRAM GXP chain set and your chain set was, say, I don't know, Force or Red, you could interchange if you put a non-drive side power meter crank arm on the other side, as long as it's GXP and it's SRAM, it doesn't matter if the group sets are mismatched, um, as long as the crank's the same length, you know, if you're force going with red or red going with force, you know, that'll, that'll work as well. I hope that answers your question. Um, and in a similar vein, well, uh, Burn, Burnsy919 has said, can I use a crank sided power meter that's made for 105 um, and can Ultegra be used on Tiagra for 700? Yeah. So if you, it, I mean, the same thing applies. If you get you know, a, a power meter crank arm. So it's a crank arm like this, non-drive side, with a little power meter pod on. So you get four I ones, stages. They will slot on the side as well. So you know, that's that's all. That's all good. That should work uh, as long as it's Shimano with Shimano. Should be fine. And they're the similar generation. Uh, so they have this on the end there. Let me show you that. Ooh, there you go. Uh, next question is from Rover Two Hundred Power. 
Uh, hi Ollie, not tech related, but as many races are cancelled this season, I've decided to attempt an Everesting. I was wondering what was the most climb you did in training before your attempt and how many days of rest did you have beforehand? Yeah, this isn't technically a tech question, but it is a subject that's close to my heart. <laughs> so I'm gonna answer it anyway. Um, I went out the, to ride for a couple of hours the day before um, and I do this before I ever ride any kind of event. It may sound counterintuitive to someone who's less experienced or a beginner, but nothing major, but just gets the blood flowing through the legs. Stops you having dead legs on the day of the event. Um, and I would say my advice would be do as big a ride as possible as you can before preparing for an Everest. Um, I was limited by my life commitments and, and other things. So the biggest ride I got in was about seven and a half hours which um, I would have liked ideally to have done a longer one, but that did involve 6,000 meters of climbing and five reps up the Col de la Madone, so it's pretty good training. But uh, yeah, if you, the longer you can do, I would say the better will prepare you. With any event, I'd say it's always about specificity. Try and replicate your event and training. That'll always put you in a good place. Uh, next question is from Jan, who says, what happened to John? So the reality is that John decided he wanted to work off camera behind the scenes working on the new GCN app. So if you've not downloaded it yet, get it downloaded. There's loads of cool stuff on there and polls and all sorts of things you can vote on and it'll help us hopefully improve the content that we deliver to you uh, in these videos. So get involved. Uh, next question is from <laughs> PilotGuy81. He says, Ollie, on the topic of disc brakes, can you run mismatched sizes of discs? I'm thinking of 160 up front, 140 on the rear. You see different size discs in motorsport, is there appropriate carryover to cycling? Yeah, there is. You know, the physics of slowing down uh, are, are the same on a road bike, pretty much as they are on a motorbike. So, you know, you exert more braking stress, usually in, in, in the front wheel. Um, and so you'll often see a bigger disc at the front of your bike and you, there's less required, you know, your weight's over the front wheel. But if you want to make your discs smaller, if you want to even make your front one smaller, if you've got flat mount disc brake calipers, like come on most new bikes now, it's like it's kind of become the standard and they're on this Orbea as well, you just simply adjust, you can slide up the caliper where it sits on the fork and by adjusting that you can change the size of the, the rotor that you want to fit on there. But yeah, a 140 at the rear, absolutely fine. I mean, you could probably even go down to like a 120 if you want. And some bikes actually come spec this way as well. Christian Matheson uh, says, Hi Ollie, I, I retrieved a Canyon Ultimate CF SL from the early 2000s. Nice, that's like the kind of Cadell Evans bike, I think. Did he ride one of those? Maybe it's a bit before Cadell, don't know. Kill-L's World Championship bike. Anyway, I'm currently restoring it to keep me busy in these times, nice. Uh, however, as I've come to notice, the headset is unlike anything I've seen before. It's an Acros iLock system with an Acros AL70 bearings. Uh, as I am a conservative rider, I'd like to swap the headset out for a standard system with an expander plug. Is it possible to use the Acros iLock system with an expander plug, or do I have to fit a whole other system? I can't find another dust cap as there will be a little gap of two or three millimeters. Yeah, I think you should be all right by keeping the Acros headset as it is on there as a collar, as like a dust cap. Um, that should work and then just use a normal expanding headset inside. The, as I understand it, the big advantage of those Acros headsets was that they were a lighter solution than using a traditional expanding headset. And, but they did have a slight flaw in that the, often the little Torx key to tighten them up on the collar, which I don't know if you can't see because my bike's too high, but on the collar of the headset, uh, they, we, people sometimes rounded out those, those Torx key, those Torx bolts. And a lot of pro teams that were using those bikes, when I've seen pro bikes, they, they've taken them off and they've put their own normal expand, expanding headset inside uh, those, those bikes. So yeah, put a normal expanding one in. Should be fine. Uh, next question is from Ewan Kirk. Like everybody, I'm a super clean drivetrain. I like a super clean drivetrain. Um, and you've got an ultrasonic bath as well. Nice. And uh, however, he says, he says he has to remove his chain to clean it. And he says he's got a super link on his chain, but he wants to know will 
repeatedly undoing his superlink to then clean his chain weaken the superlink how many times can you do it well it depends on your brand of chain superlink they come with instructions and if you don't have the instructions you'll be able to find them online for your specific chain as to how many times you should be able to undo it and unuse it according to their recommendation i've found that i can usually go a few more times beyond their recommendation but like with many things they're there for for safety and liability um what you can do though is buy additional super links. You can buy spare ones. So once you've used it a few times, change it. Why not? And the other thing is, is you don't, you know, you don't need to be obsessive compulsive about cleaning your chain. If you're going to do a deep clean on your chain, then you know, once a month or something, you know, like special occasions, you don't need to do it after every ride. So also while on the topic of chains there was a question last week about the guy whose chain was skipping in the 11 tooth after he changed his chain um now yeah there was quite a few comments on this which was great to see thanks for everyone that, that commented on it i just wanted to highlight a couple that stood out to me of things i didn't say so yes the reason why it could be skipping as well uh, as people rightly pointed out was that the check the chain length is correct as when you've changed the chain sometimes you might have made the chain a little bit too long that could be causing you a problem the other thing um, could be that the chain link where you've joined the chain on the new chain is stiff and that's causing a bit of skipping especially around the tightest cogs so just check those two things but yeah thanks for everyone that commented um, next question is from senior sports who says i've been trying i've been having problems with my speed sensor it works fine most of the time but when i'm on the turbo trainer and i go up over 37 38 miles per hour whoa okay big dog um <laughs> It will, uh, it will fall and say I'm doing about 19. Is this a faulty sensor or something else? How can I fix this? Um, so there's a number of things that this could be. Firstly, check the battery. Sometimes sensors tend to drop out a bit and the signal gets a bit crap when the coin cell batteries in them start to get, get low. So probably change the battery, see how that gets on. Also, you haven't said what kind of sensor it is, whether it's Bluetooth or Ant Plus, but Sometimes you can have issues with the connectivity of the sensor to say your laptop or your system, whatever you're reading it to, whether it's a head unit or whatever. Um, this can be interrupted by things like having a microwave oven or other electrical appliances nearby. Uh, so try and minimize the distance of the sensor to the, to the uh, Bluetooth module or the um, Ant Plus dongle or your head unit, whatever you're using. Other things that can impact it are firmware on your devices. So check that your firmware is up to date. Often there are little bugs that cause dropouts of signals. Um, and the, the creators of these devices iron these out by doing firmware updates. So that's something else to consider as well. Also, if you're running your speed sensor to like say a laptop and you're using an Ant Plus dongle, um, another thing can be if your laptop goes into like low power mode or your tablet goes into low power mode because its battery's not low or it's not plugged in, sometimes that can reduce power to USB ports as well and make cause, cause intermittent dropouts. I've, I've heard of that happening before. So there's quite a few little buggy things that it could be. First thing, change the battery, see how you get on. <laughs> Next question is from Christine Narcilla, who says, how can I remove sealant from tubular, tubular tires? You have to take the tires off and then wash the sealant out. Um, but my advice is don't do this on your mum's best carpet in the living room. Do it in a bathroom or bath or preferably outside because it's a messy job and sealant goes everywhere. But yeah, it's worth doing periodically because the sealant does go off and does like dry up and stuff. So it's good to change it. Um, so last question this week from Rico Lino who says, I'm still irritated. Where is that rotten plant in the background? Well, I mean, the plant, like many of us in lockdown, we're all in this together. The plant has been having a tough time. Here it is, but, right, I have been putting my time in lockdown to good use and the plant's struggling, but I've been learning magic. So I'm gonna use my magic skills that I've learned to try and bring the plant back to health. So here goes. Sound effects.
Wow, look at that. I mean, it's, it's, definitely, it's definitely the same plant. And I, I mean, I'm, I've excelled myself there. I mean, that's, that's beyond my expectations. I didn't expect it to go that well. Well, there you go. Um, keep your questions coming in as ever. I hope you've enjoyed this week's GCN Tech Clinic. Uh, like and subscribe, all that jazz, if you've not done already. And, you know, head over to the shop. Get yourself a mug. I'm out. I'm finished. I need a refill. I'll see you next week. Bye.